Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Please excuse my voice. I think I have whatever's going around. But uh, I'm so excited and um, my heart is warmed by seeing all of you and especially those of you in my short time here, a year and a half. Um, I have made some tremendous connections with folks from here in Virginia. And I just want to acknowledge Horace Scruggs and Naya Bates and so many others, and of course my faculty and colleagues before I go into um, the meaning and the purpose of our event this evening. So I just stand here with a very grateful heart uh, as I kick off the Outsider Preservation Initiative. So my work has very much been about bringing the inside in, I'm mean, bringing the outside in rather, and that's the work of all of the illustrious guests we have here today. Uh, that work began uh, for me before be coming to UVA um, in cultivating the Freedom Colony identity in the Texas Freedom Colonies Project, which is about organizing a set of organizing principles about preservation as a form of time travel and a way to go back and get. Uh, the Sankofa principle of going back and getting knowledge and bringing it into the present and then propelling it into our futures. And to tell our stories and to ensure that our layers and our multiplicities are seen, protected, and celebrated. That has been the work that will continue to be the work going forward. As was mentioned, Mellon has generously funded for three years a $3 million initiative called the Outsider Preservation Initiative, which asks this fundamental question. How do commemoration and oral tradition activate the larger diaspora of freedom colony, that is historic black settlement descendants, to document, protect, and regenerate endangered freedom colonies? This is a question I asked 10 years ago when spending my time in East Texas. It's the question that I asked when I went throughout the rest of the state and developed a program for volunteers to capture those stories and to preserve them and building an online presence for those stories. But now we take this project and extend it to the rest of the United States because these are creation stories. These are stories of beginnings. And these stories of beginnings of black communities are the story of the beginnings of the United States. Speaking of brilliance, I'm going to present to you now Dr. Maya Butler, thought partner, friend, colleague, partner in crime. She comes to us from the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and she will be co-moderating this evening, but she's going to tell you a little bit more about the dialogue and conversation that we're having here and kind of the, the thought genealogy behind it. Thank you. Thank you everyone for attending tonight and for joining us in an amazing dance exercise with Stacy. Um, as Andrea said, I am Maya Butler. I am Associate Professor of African American Literature in the English Department at University of North Carolina, Wilmington. I'm a co-founder of the Edwige Danticat Society, and I'm currently in the place of creating a literary geographies laboratory. So thinking more about how to think about place, think about geography, ecologies from somewhere that might seem like outside the humanities, the arts. Um, but it's so much of what we do in my classroom and so much of what I think about in my mind. So I'm very glad to be here with all of you tonight. Um, I will introduce our speakers and maybe as you all take the stage. Um, and then they will uh, I'll foreground sort of what the opening questions are that um, informed the creation of some slides that they have to share with you and telling you a little bit about the work that they do. Uh, so Dr. Christy Hyman is the Andrew W. Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow for Freedom on the Move at Cornell University in the Department of History. Michelle Lanier is an Afro-Carolina folklorist, oral 
cultural historian, museum professional, filmmaker, and educator with over two decades of commitment to her callings. Dr. Danielle Purifoy is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And Dr. J.T. Rome is assistant professor of Africana Studies and Geography and Andrew W. Mellon Chair in Global Racial Justice at the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice at Rutgers University. So when Andrea and I came together to begin to think about what we wanted to share with you tonight, we based uh, three questions around arts-based practice. We wanted to think about how we and how our speakers engage in our own sort of personal interior arts-based practices, and also how we bring our arts-based practices into the community, into our classrooms. So I will share with you the three questions that we gave to our speakers, and then we will turn it over to them to show you some slides and talk through their arts-based practices. The first question really is, what is arts-based practice? What are our respective comings to art-based practices? The second question is, how has personal art practice functioned as a sustainability practice for engaged scholars? And the third question is, how do we use arts-based practice in our teaching and research as a methodology, as approach in our classrooms, and in our engagement with our communities? So I will turn it over to Christy. You have this. Okay, I use nature photography to exhibit the timeless echoes of cultural life through restoring human connection to landscape and opening opportunity to restore the sustainability of the earth. I began with a, a, a slide of a, uh, what they call a blood red russula. Uh, it is a type of fungi, it is a mycorrhizal fungi found in, uh, found in well, this was found in Ithaca, but you can find them uh, all over the Eastern uh, seaboard. This is common self heal. It is a, uh, it is Prunella vulgaris, and it, the first time I encountered it where I was aware of it, was on Morgan Prairie in Noxabee County, Mississippi. And at that time, I was trying to negotiate living in a very different space that I'd ever lived in in my life. And I saw the shape of the flowers and erroneously thought that they might the slight tubular form to them might attract a hummingbird, but actually they attract uh, bumblebees and butterflies. The last one was a puzzling uh, image to me, but this is the occasion of adventitious roots, which come when something stressful or a wound hits a plant. And what it does is it, it shoots out these suckers or, or sprouts or shoots, as you want to call it. This is willow. And it comes from a, a source other than the main plant that it's growing from. These are its family members. And this is regeneration. And this is an ethos that, uh, that guides a lot of my work. Thank you. Thank you. So I am Michelle Lanier. I am Afro-Carolina. 
Um, I come from mixed race black people from both Carolinas, and I'm deeply interested in this notion of the womanist cartographies, the womanist um, cosmographies, um, and the contours of memory that I can join with kindred species. So here you literally have this symbology of Afro, the okra, the okra when cleft on the horizontal becomes twin boats that represent the slave ships of which my ancestors were seeds that then created whole worlds. Cleft on the uh, vertical, it's a star, um, a, a guiding light. And then you hear, have the Algonquin word named uh, scuppernong which we know is a short season, um, but a sweet season. And here's a landscape that um, I wandered, but um, this is the land that holds um, my heart and my callings. And so part of my creative practice is, um, is, is watching, is surrendering to witness to these ancestral spaces. Um, then I like to uh, create new kinds of cartography, um, performative cartography, ephemeral cartography. Um, this image in the middle is a frying pan that was found in my maternal grandmother's home that I entered only three for the first time, three years after she died because it just felt bereft of spirit within her absence. And I was put um, gifted this pan. You'll notice there's a mark where the thumb goes. So over and over again, cooking for uh, people who I am blood kin with, my grandmother created a mark. It's a map of her soul. Um, I'm also interested in playing with light, um, self-portraiture. It's a kind of catharsis, a kind of uh, mapping of desire and possibility and speculative notions of, of self. This is a found image of black folks in the midst of cutting up, having fun, being femme, um, getting funky, and I don't know their names. This picture was uh, for sale on Etsy, and I felt that I could make a home for them. I also love to curate a playlist. I'm in good company. And I like to think along with music um, about cartography and Black South and the Black Femme South and the Black Queer South and um, you know, the Black South Sonics, and, uh, you know, here we have Say You'll Go, and Solange says, but where do we go? Um, I believe that she is representing Black South, you know, and Femme South sound waves. Um, if you listen to these lyrics very closely, where do we go, you hear a cartograph around displacement and uh, kind of memory around family and, and home. That's me. Thank you. Of course. All right. Um, so I'm delighted to be here in such great company, and thanks so much to. Um, Dr. Roberts and Dr. Butler for the invitation to join today and to all of our panelists. Um, so I think I can answer these questions with some images and brief audio from a collaborative documentary arts project that I did back in 2016 with abstract painter and sculptor Torquase Dyson and the project is called In Conditions of Fresh Water. So Tokwasi and I traveled to two historic black communities in North Carolina and in the Alabama Black Belt um, to consider how environmental racism shapes the landscapes of black communities, and most importantly, how black communities deploy various strategies of collectivism, ecological stewardship, and cultural production to sustain themselves despite dominant white, white supremacist geographic practices. As Tokwasi's quote here notes, Part of our work together was to image and imagine movements and geographies of freedom to understand how critical fluidity and flexibility is to black spatial existence across time and space. So we traveled from place to place in Tarquase Studio South Zero, which is pictured here, a solar powered mobile artist studio made partially of recycled wood, recycled wood materials. 
Um, and as I spoke to community members in West End in North Carolina and Whitehall in Alabama about their histories and the lives and commitments they've made in these places, Turquoise interpreted the contours of those spaces using abstract painting and, and drawings based on architectural design techniques. She's always asking the question, what is the shape of black freedom? How does that shape move and morph as necessary to adapt to ever-changing conditions of our environments due to ordinary life and to the various fast and slow violences of dominant spatial practices? Here is just um, one excerpt um, from Mr. Remy Graves from the West End community where he's speaking about a place where West End residents built for themselves um, for pleasure and entertainment during segregation called The Bottom. And this is uh, Turquoise's um, uh, sculptural drawing or sort of um, architectural drawing and interpretation of that space. And it's called Our Own Good Time Place 1 and 2. Just a neighborhood still just like family. That's usually where we go down in, in the bottom, people down, we call it the bottom. I don't know why, I didn't name it uh, for my time. <laughs> but like a dead end road, a dead end street or whatever, you go down there and just, we never seen any white people down there. That was where the, you know, the like there's nothing to do on the weekend. So, I, uh, you know, bootlegging and a little party houses or something like that, you know. Uh, the place up the street, uh, Rainbow, uh, Twilight Inn. It was just places for people to gather on West End, something to do on the weekend. And uh, you you know, you couldn't go downtown and have a good time like that of color, right. you know. You, so we got to create our own good time place. Mm -hmm. And okay. so you had like yeah. local clubs, local, and those little, sorts little, of little, little, little juke joints, little juke, little joints. juke okay. joint. <laughs> good food, good home cooking food. Okay, yeah, you had live music. Actually, in Medmen that I can remember, Betty Swan, you may never hear her, James Brown. They, they've been here in Medmen, right up the street up there, at another little club there, what it was. I don't know the name. Orange, yeah. Orange, no, somewhere, Orange Bowl or something like that. Orange Bowl? I think that was the name of it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Andrea and Maya. This is and co-panelists. Um, I uh, I'm gonna skip that and come back to it. Um, my primary um, artistic practice right now is um, is moving in film, um, and I must say that that's primarily coming to me through a series of losses. Um, first, my father actually first my home church in 2015 blew away in a tornado in, in February of 2015. And then I lost my father in 2017. And I've just been trying to deal with that and also deal with the kind of realities of serial loss in, in this part of the Tidewater, Virginia. And I come to those practices, um, wonderfully enough, one of my great mentors is in the room, um, Claudrina Harold, Dr. Claudrina Harold, um, in the history department here at the University of Virginia. I'm also a, a former Wahoo. Um, so, um, you know, when I, about a couple of years after I graduated, um, Professor Harold, as I still call her, um, and Kevin Everson were just, they just started making films. And I think when, when I heard um, Professor Harold say that they was gonna make films, I was like, it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be a documentary style, but it was experimental. You know, Kevin Everson's work that you know is experimental. And I, that, that's been so freeing for me, because I think history sometimes feels like a kind of bound relationship to place that sometimes can feel static. But what what um, this kind of praxis allows in this more open form for me um, is another kind of imaginative Afrofuturist or um, or Sankofa Afrofuturist orientation. Um, and so this this still is taken from a film um, that I released as part of um, the Spirit House project, Crossroads project um, that's housed at Princeton. Um, and we, had, uh, we shot this uh, Johnny Mercer, we're at the headwaters of the uh, Mount Landing Creek. Um, this is at an extent plantation that was settled in the 1650s um, and was worked by enslaved laborers up until 1860, right, right at the beginning of the Civil War. Um, <clears throat> 
period. Um, and this water was before 1940. It wasn't dammed, and you could navigate this this creek by flatboat, which is why they built the from the main river, which is why they built the plantation there. Um, and Johnny, um, we want, we actually went to this plantation trying to animate a space that was um, that was an unmarked burial site um and when, when he started to do we have lots of footage of it and when he did it because they still produce out of that same field and they growing food on top of our ancestors that's a whole other topic um it, it looks like he's just in a field it's it, it's nondescript and so we found this waterway and we started to work with that the other parts of the film really um, focus in on the church that was lost and focusing in on the ground there um and really and really um, engaging in the various layers of loss, but also the possibility that come from black place through loss, even in loss or despite loss, some relationship to loss. Um, and I think, okay. I, I think in, in terms of community, I've been trying to mobilize this kind of art to reanimate a different sense of value or different senses of values that are operative within black communities and rural black communities about place um, that, that don't have cash at the center or that are collectively stewarded spaces. Like churches are, black churches in Virginia are a strange form of property. Like how many places in the United States are not owned by one person or one family or one corporation are actually democratically controlled by vote? <laughs> Voters get to say yay or nay on the direction of that. That's, that's unique. And also just inheriting the sense that I could, because my father is buried here at another church my great grandmother is buried this sense from being weird in these communities that because i have that ancestral linkage i could walk onto these places without that's not you can't walk onto the white church ground in tabani virginia <laughs> they will they gonna call 911 so just the i like what is that that's a weird and unique like space that you could walk into because you have that sense of ancestral connection to it. And I want to explore that and 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 um and explode that I think in a moment in which land is being bought up all over rural areas, but especially in rural Virginia for a new energy regime, right? Is we're we're facing another round of enclosure. So how do we animate place and senses of value um outside of that sense of value, but also artistically. So it's not just do this or do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, panelists. I really appreciate the ways that this diverse kind of set of methodologies, of approaches, of frameworks um, really can show the amazing range of ways that folks observe their places, relate to their places, preserve their places in order to share their places. These scholars are sharing with us a black sense and experience of place that might otherwise not be captured by dominant cartographic practices. And this is the very purpose of the Outsider Preservation Initiative. These black places deserve to be experienced, protected, remembered, and sustained. So I would like to invite you all as we move into the next set of questions, hold your questions in, in your head because we'll leave some time at the end for questions and engagement with the audience. Um, but we'll move now to a few questions that will help us from our various praxis consider together the impacts and the possibilities of our arts-based practices. I'll start with one question, maybe start with Danielle, and then I'll give another, and we'll start with Michelle. So the first question is, how do we encounter black landscapes at the intersection of our interior and also our engaged arts-based practices? Um, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, oof, okay, so um, I think I come to um, I come to black um, places and historic black places like uh, West End that you um, saw in my um, presentation, um, both as someone who has 
a kind of um, intimacy with those places. Um, I uh, spent a lot of time in a black place called Soul City, North Carolina, when I was um, a young person. Um, and so I had a kind of attachment um, to the kind of um, collective community building um, that happens in black rural places um, as a kid. And I never imagined that it would be part of my own kind of scholarly practice. Um, I never imagined myself as a geographer either, but, um, but that's, that's what happened. Um, and so I think um, there's some part of me that's always um, trying to make sure that um, as I um, connect with these various communities, um, that I'm arriving or tap into that part of myself that was just a kid in Soul City um, being part of a place and not being in kind of uh, outsider, like objective, you know, 500 foot view, right? Like um, uh, observer of a place. Um, and so um, it's a slow practice, I think. Um, it means that I go and visit places a lot and I try to build relationships in places. I try to, to the extent that, you know, they need volunteers to do things, right? Like I show up in those particular ways. And so there's a um, way to kind of um, recultivate that intimacy, even if I don't live in the place. Um, and so I think that that um, informs a different kind of scholarly practice um, and I think the arts in particular are really useful, right, for that kind of practice as well, because um, it's very hard to do art without intimacy. Um, I think it can be done, but I think that it's like, I think it's hard to, I don't wanna, like, I don't wanna value art in any kind of particular way, but I think that it's hard to do um, well in a way that it's felt without a form of intimacy. And I think that kind of um, bringing the interior in, <laughs> right, to a place that you may not belong to, right, um, and using art as a mode of doing that is really useful. Um, so, um, and I didn't really learn, um, I think, that kind of practice um, until I did this, um, was brought into or invited into a collaboration um, practice with Torquase Dyson, and it's been so useful for my work ever since. We can. Not really. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. You good? Um, I really like what you said, Danielle, about about slowness, and I think especially for rural black place, if you pop up and you don't have a certain kind of ethos around taking your time. People may have a superficial kind of greeting and welcome for you, but they are not integrating you into they into their into their worlds. And I think that's critical. And I think I did I also wanted to show through the film, especially a kind of intimacy with place that I think um I think we're all, like the center of this film, which this may not convey because that's the end, um, really is at churchyards um mm -hmm. and center around the morning practices that we engage in on a regular basis, often yearly, um, at my grandmother's um birthday, where we, you know, where we go clean the grave and all of this stuff, but we also have a little solo cup. I'll just let that be what that means and y'all get it. <laughs> um and we and we have a good time. And I think that opens up so much um that opens up so much in the film it's 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 fascinating to hear the the gaps and possibilities of connection diasporically when different communities see it northerners have a relationship because they may not have the same kind of churchyard but they may have gone back and forth and they have a certain kind of relationship with that landscape caribbean folks have their own kind of like practices that are related to this and like they see something else like it's caribbean folks who pointed out to me that we are in a circle they like y'all who doing i'm like okay got got it don't tell my mama and daddy and them <laughs> they're gonna, they not gonna like that um but I think um, I wanted to also say and just name um, the importance of cultural organizing to my um, to my outlook. I think I had came out of University of Virginia, went to the Center for Third World Organizing. At that time, Wendy Marshall was here. She had kind of shepherded me into that process. And I came to organizing in that practice that was very numbers oriented. How many people did you talk to today? How many doors did you knock on? And I think that... 
Um, I, w- I had the opportunity to go to the Highlander Center at a certain point with Ebony Golden and um, Tafar Walla Muhammad and others who um, who took up cultural organizing as a, as a means and a method. And that and cultural organizing is like it doesn't have an endpoint necessarily in mind. It has values and goals and desires, and it does work. It, and ultimately, it is slow, right? But but I think when we think climate, for example, that's really where my sort of interest and thought lies. Because you can see the water here, we're projected to be in an uninhabitable place. Um, so sometimes that urgency will provoke us to want to do something right here, right now. And yet that right here, right now is like that perpetual thing is part of the problem, like that speed. Um, and so I think returning to and also i just think i wanted to show through this practice beauty to ourselves back to ourselves something that's genuine and organic to our community that will not be foreign but that's also engaged with somebody like johnny mercer who can create beauty in place that i would never be able to do somebody asked me one time is that you dancing i'm like no nah, don't try to play me <laughs> not me at all um so yeah i think slowness and I, I, um and moving at that kind of pacing and cultivating intimacy, all things I want to underscore as part of what Danielle has said, but also my own practice. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts, Christy or Michelle? I'll play. Mm-hmm. Um, this word. Oh, oh. Get the new play. Okay. Okay. Sorry. How's that? Oh. I hear me. Um, I've been thinking about interior, that word, a lot. Um, So for me, you know, I mean, the word art is just so layered. It's so loaded and heavy, and there's so many different modalities. And so for me, I'm very, very fortunate, very blessed that I was exposed to a variety of art forms very early. Um, I have, you know, an ancestral uncle, Larry Lebby, who um, was a painter. Um, after the Charleston Massacre, he was commissioned to paint um, Pinckney's uh, portrait, you know, and, and I lived with some of his pieces in the house. And I remember my first art exhibit, and I reached out to touch. And my cousin, his daughter, was like, no, you can't touch, because, you know, I'm like, why? And she said, the oil from your fingers might you know, disintegrate some of daddy's hard work that he's worked on. And and I remember thinking, I'm going to listen to you, but one day I'm going to paint something just so I can touch it. (laughs) And I did, like, as a kid, you know, and I I did have a chance to to do a little painting um, under Arturo Lindsay, who um, famously has worked with, like, Fahamo Peko and Amy Sherrill during my Spelman time. So I I did painting. I I was exposed to my aunt by love, Verna Mae, Smart Grosvenor, and you know she created whole worlds with writing and, and culinary arts and and film. But words were my first um, artistic home. I remember falling in love with reading and writing and writing little poems in my little lock journal, thinking nobody could get up in there. Um, and and then finding theater. You know, when you grow up in certain Black South spaces, you are taught to a certain times of year to stand in front of those gatherings of people and to elocute and to comport yourself and to enunciate and to project. And you're taught, you know, to embody Rosa Parks and you got to be Harriet and you, you know, and for, for, you know, for, and they're like, go ahead, baby. And, you know, and so you learn the, the power that adults will pause and watch you have dance contests you know, on Christmas Eve. And so I learned the power of art. And so for me, art has been root cellar, spice cabinet, medicine chest, um, every, you know, every, every moment of joy and trauma of my life has been stitched through with art. I, I had a, an extraordinary um, uncle by marriage who was a drag queen, Amaker Celestic Mickle. And he's who taught me how to put on pantyhose and blush and the first day I met him, he was dressed as Tina Turner to go to a drag show, and it was the day my mother had died. And that was magic. What a blessing. And he taught me the art of self-adornment um, and the power of that, of shape-shifting. 
and the beauty and alchemy of self-possession. And so I'm really thinking, though, about the Black Interiors book, you know, by Elizabeth Alexander. I really keep coming back to that because in Gullah community, you'll see these heirs' property, you know, little plots where the law says you can't build anything, but you can have a moving domicile. And so that's why you see all these trailers in places like Hilton Head and St. Helens, South Carolina. And you'll see these trailers and they'll kind of look a little ramshackle with all this, you know, stuff in the yard and they'll squeeze another trail in for the next generation. You go inside these trailers. And when I tell you the, the installation of altar spaces and sacred spaces and sensual spaces and I mean living rooms with you know the black baby doll and the hand crochet you know ball gown and and you know and all of the the, the archives the family archives the elegance the grandeur of these interiors um, is just also something that I live with um, and then, yeah, theater, um, you know, like all the things. And to, you grow up hearing your, your parents debate about Ntozaka Shange, you know, and it, just all of that has helped me to understand that art is medicine, it's conjure, um, it's memory work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love what you all have said about interiority and what you've said about intimacy. Um, the emotional connection um, in the morning practices. I'd love to have us think about emotional landscapes. Let's think about how the physical landscapes and the built environments that we access through our arts-based practices, how they inform our understandings of the emotional landscapes of the communities that we work with or the students that we teach, or the research that we do. How do our physical landscapes and built environments that we access teach us something about the emotional landscapes that are related to? Well, thanks, Christy. Well, I had the opportunity to go to the Edmund Pettus Bridge for the first time in the year 2022 during the Asala uh, Conference in Montgomery, Alabama. And it was the first time that I uh, walked the bridge. I walked the bridge with my friends, who are all historians, Nashani Frazier, who's at NC State, uh, Jacoby Williams, who's at Indiana uh, Bloomington, and uh, Randall Jelks, who's also at uh, Indiana Bloomington, and Tara White, who's at UNC Wilmington. And Tara, being a woman of Alabama, grew up in Alabama, on the way to the bridge, she, told, she pointed in a direction on the highway and said, that's where the white teacher was shot and the black student played dead. They had come back from Bloody Sunday, but a, sni a KKK sniper in the Meadows saw the car, saw the white woman, saw the black student, automatically assumed that she was an anarchist or freedom rider, shot her, thought they shot the boy. He pretended to be dead. And once they were gone, he limped out into the Meadows until he finally got home. Now, this was before we even got to the foot of the, uh, of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. But once we got there, it was a very beautiful day. It was surrounded by these vernacular iconographies that were made by the people of Selma and their descendants. Uh, across the street, you saw an abandoned strip mall that was adorned with various murals of uh, Barack Obama, Malcolm X, uh, Harriet Tubman, the usual icons of black liberation, black progress. Then across the street, you see vote. And then as you get to the entrance, where you can walk the bridge, there is an assortment of memorials to unsung civil rights uh, heroes. Of course, Martin Luther King, of course, Coretta uh, Scott King, but also people of Selma, people of Montgomery, people of Mississippi, 
who also did that work, but for some reason weren't able to get national attention. But the thing that broke me down and, and dissolved me into tears was what they called the tomb of the unknown slave. And for me, what that showed was that they were, they, the community saw the culmination and the co connection between the afterlife of enslavement and the civil rights struggles and the ongoing struggles for justice today. So in that landscape, there's a variety of icons, a variety of places of memory, but also a place where people are making what some would call makeshift altars mm -hmm. that remain undisturbed, mm -hmm. even in a very hostile place that uh, some parts of the Deep South are. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to emotional landscapes, I think <coughs> we should see them, we, could, we should see any landscape, no matter how beautiful or wasteful it might look, that that place that looks abandoned could be a site of beauty a site of regeneration, or that place that is opulent and beautiful with columns is a place of misery, mm -hmm. because one sees Elizabeth Keckley and knows that she was beaten when she was five years old because she dozed off while she was shaking the baby, trying to keep the baby you know, in a good way so it could go to sleep. She shook the baby too hard because she was dozing off. The baby flipped out of it, out of its carriage, and she was whipped mercilessly. But yet that beautiful stately house. So I think when it comes to emotional landscapes, emotional built environments, they're layered depending on the viewers, the viewers, act of orienting themselves mm -hmm. into that space. Thank you. Um, I'll just say the first thing that came to mind, Maya, was um, uh, the town of Princeville, uh, North Carolina, which is um, one of it's in Eastern North Carolina, and it is one of the first uh, Black municipalities, um, incorporated municipalities in the United States. It was incorporated in 1885, um, but the community has been there since emancipation. Um, so, if you've ever heard anything about Princeville, one of the things that, the, if like literally, if you Googled it right now, the first thing that you would see is maybe an image of the sign, the historical marker for Princeville for which was previously called Freedom Hill Underwater, um, because um, Princeville was founded in a floodplain. It was the, um, the planters, planter class's refuse land um, and was a way to simultaneously give black folks um, a kind of place of their own, right? Assign them to land um, and to um, maintain, right? A black labor force um, in the town of Tarboro and surrounding communities post-emancipation to keep people from going north, essentially, or moving out. And Princeville has flooded um, pretty totally, like catastrophically, about seven times in its history. And each time, I mean, it's been twice within my lifetime, once during Hurricane Floyd in 1999, and uh, the second in 2016 during Hurricane Matthew. Um, and this is all waters from the, the Tar River, which divides Princeville from Tarboro, um, which is the historic, I call it the sort of plantation town. Um, and I think one of the things that, um, yeah, that emotional geographies uh, brings up for me is the kind of simultaneity of like the commitment of folks to a place like Princeville, even though they know that they live in a kind of liminal and temporary space, right? They rebuild over and over again, right? Um, and this is within like, you know, some people's, uh, I think the, the, the previous flood to the one in 99 was in 65. So you can imagine that in one person's lifetime, they may have had to move back to that same place and rebuild from, from start, <laughs> right? From scratch three times. Um, and I think about like 
simultaneously, like what kind of grief, right, a place like Princeville could hold um, for those communities and also the like really intense commitment, right, and passion um, uh, they have for the place that they would rebuild so many times. Um, and it kind of reminds me also of like, you know, all of these sort of bottom lands, like what um, Mr. Remy Graves was talking about, um, these sort of bottom land areas that are swamps. I don't know how many of you saw the remake of The Color Purple, right, over the holidays, um, but um, you know that, right, like um, Harpo builds a juke joint, right, on the swamp, right? And that is very much what he's talking about in the clip. He's talking about the Orange Bowl, the Twilight Inn, those kind of spaces that are um, spaces of pleasure and play and recreation, right, and freedom, and also are very vulnerable, right, um, to the floodwaters. So I really think about like that kind of, um, the duality, right, or the multifacetedness of like a place that people think of as wasteland, right, that dominant spatial geographies, right, um, hegemonic white geographic practice would say, this is a, you know, they might say that it's a vulnerable ecological area that we shouldn't touch now, right, um, at this point, right? Maybe previously they might have said, oh, this is a wasteland. It's, it's not worth anything to us because we can't do anything with it. Um, and for Black folks, it's never been either one of those things, right? It's always been a space of relation um, and a space that you had to, um, that you developed a great affection for, right? Um, it might have been the, the place where you could escape, right? Um, enslavement, it might have been the place where you could escape, right? The long arm of Jim Crow white supremacy. Um, and it may be the place where you lost your home, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, I think about how a lot of these landscapes, even if the structures don't exist anymore, we may read them in one way, right? But they may have all of these like multi-layered kinds of histories that if we know something about the ecology, if we know something about cultivation around the space and that kind of thing, we might, um, we actually might be able to identify where those spaces are. Um, it's another kind of reading of the land. Um, and I think uh, another kind of way to kind of engage in thinking about um, those different layers in space. Thank you. Michelle. Yeah, just to riff on what Danielle said, I, I think a lot, a lot about what archaeologists call stratigraphic time, um, layers of time. Um, I ask myself regularly, you know, what what did the land witness? Who did the land witness? Um, what's calling to be called out? And then I've been thinking, as I shared earlier, a lot about what are the kindred species. So, for me, one of the key one is the longleaf pine and thinking about how that particular species was bled um, of its turpentine tar and pitch to make slaving ships watertight to buy enslaved African hands so that more enslaved people could be brought. And when I see a baby longleaf pine, if you've never seen a baby longleaf pine, I highly recommend it because it is, um, it looks as if it's going to walk toward you. Um, the way it grows, it's not trunk first. It's kind of this green scrub brush. If you remember Cousin It, it's like this green, <laughs> prickly, you know, uh, toddler is about to walk toward you. And when I look at them, I acknowledge that their ancestors and my ancestors were both extracted. And that the existence of us is quite miraculous. And so I always have this kind of spiritual salute, this acknowledgement moment when I see a longleaf pine, particularly a young one, because it is a, a, a mirroring um, across time um, that we acknowledge the, um, the beauty that we have both survived all of this and that we're here still you know, respirating together. Thank you. Um, as I was saying before, I think loss and sadness have really animated my praxis. Like, I can't deny that. As much as I would like to <laughs> hop to the joy part, it is not, it's not the first thing that I have to sit in when I'm dealing with the emotional landscapes of home. I think as there's deep loss for me personally, but I also think the intergenerational losses that punctuate, that's the tide water. You know, I mean the the peak of tidewater slavery at the end of the 18th century 
leads to a whole nother generation up to several generations up to for the next century after that that are displaced right you know you can't go to a, a slave narrative from the WPA or other sources from that part of the Tidewater or Virginia in general that's not, that's not like my aunt, cousin, brother, mother, or whoever else was sold. Um, so I guess even within that, though, the power and the possibility of ongoing place practices despite all of that is, is significant. I, I've been thinking a lot about the post-emancipation landscape and the miracle of it. Um, like, first of all, people built churches in a year or two years after emancipation. I'm like, where did they get money, land, or anything? I mean, some of, we know some of it was like you know, benefactors and other things, but just as a whole impulse, like where do you even, before you own personal or familial land, you already purchased something together. That's that's a lot. Um, but I also think about stuff like, just the proliferation of like, an alternative sense of place, an alternative design on the future that is still partially there and there's, we have to like recognize that's not, that's not, simply punctuated by laws that entangles other kinds of values and cultivates other values. Um, so, and again, I lost my home church. I think when I was about 11, my, I told this story earlier and I told it multiple times, but one of my great aunts passed and I realized we didn't have a home place. It was my first recognition that, oh, we don't own anything. <laughs> like we, there's nowhere that we're all going to return to. And so I lost them to this church building and then that blew away. And so I've been, I've been pressed it's a really out of necessity thinking about the ground itself as as the thing as the place um and especially because again my my elders and ancestors are buried in that space particularly at st john's but in all around um invest in that place with with that sense of pride as well that comes even with and maybe entangled with the sadness is is that sense of that that pride and that cultivation and i think um I think there's so much, I mean, for a rural black place, we were talking about this in the, in the van over here, there's so much more to do around not just having the kind of, and the, I'm not trying to say that the historiographies and other thing, things aren't important about the narratives that we know about slavery and emancipation and, and then a brief moment of freedom and then Jim Crow and then now and blah, blah, blah. I'm not saying that all of those, it, those markers are important, uh, aren't important, but I think I think about stuff like black world nightlife, like things that we don't necessarily think about that do animate all these senses of, of value, possibility, power. And again, still, are they're very close in time and in day-to-day -day experience with loss and sadness. That's never, it's never isolated or separable from those. But I think, um, how do we, how do we reanimate and re-enchant a sense of place around black um, around the complex affective structures of a black place with all the emotional toil of, of intergenerational loss, but also endurance and, and power. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, like just, I, again, the miracle of it. These people built these places. They didn't have anything. Like they came, they stepped off the plantation. Some of them didn't even step off of it. And they already built this stuff together. That again, in this part of Virginia, it's the only democratic institutions that we could point to, right? Um, that's that's remarkable. Um, schools, churches, old folks' homes, all these things to basically produce mutual aid and care and collectivity um, when black people didn't have nothing but a prayer um, is a miracle to me. Thank you so much. When I think of you, discussing the miracle of black work to make place and to make a life. I think about, um, you know, thinking from, from my literary sphere, Phyllis Wheatley, um, you know, the first black woman to publish a book of poetry in the U.S. And I think about our mutually beloved June Jordan uh, and her piece, something like a sonnet for Phyllis Wheatley. And she calls her Phyllis Miracle Wheatley the miracle that was producing the work that she did and the conditions that she was in. And I think that's a great note to end on, is to think about the great possibility of arts practice, um, the joy 
Uh, and the way that these sorts of practices are going to help us create more just futures. Um, you know, there's a tendency um, to think of the past um, when we talk about preservation. And we also really know that there's a lot of the past in the present, but the work of the outsider preservationist initiative really is to help us sustain and promote free black places in the future. So please join me um, in thanking our panelists for their discussion.